closer. It would be nice if you wanted to join the group in the front, in the center at portion. Come closer. If you take this moment, please, to turn off your cell phones. That would be lovely and much appreciated. So if you take them out, turn them on silent. There is a thing here. If you're, uh, if you're sitting on the edge, maybe you could sort of shuffle a few seats in, and then other people can join you. We'll get started in one minute. In one minute. You have about 40 minutes. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just, if, I, if we're getting close to 40 minutes, I'll just either wave at you or flash my phone in. And that will be it. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this year's annual ASR Distinguished Lecturer. Lecture. Uh, the African Studies Review has, for at least uh, six or seven years now, been uh, hosting a, a distinguished lecture. Uh, the um, lectures that emerge from this series feature in our journal as peer-reviewed articles, and uh, last year's uh, essay, uh, Green is Thorny and Mean, uh, is already up online and available for you to read. So we are very um, excited that uh, this year our former ASA board member, a member of 
the African Studies Review Editorial Review Board, and the distinguished winner of last year's Africa Book Prize, uh, Dr. Falungom from our neighboring institution at Boston University has agreed to deliver the keynote. Uh, if you'd just like to take this moment to please silence your cell phones, I would very much appreciate that. And I know some of you think you've already done so, but I suspect you haven't. So for those who are really sure that you've done it, just take another look, because there's always one, isn't there? There's always one that rings. So I've, um, uh, I've asked my colleague, uh, Tim, to introduce to you, rather, I've asked Falu's colleague. <laughs> I've asked Falu's, Falu's colleague to introduce him properly, and uh, and then we'll hear from Falu. So, without further ado, please welcome to the podium Dr. Ting Longman, who is the director, former director of African Studies at Boston University. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so it's my honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Falun Gom. Uh, I think he's familiar to many of you, having been on the ASA board, having won the uh, African Studies Book Prize for his book, Muslims Beyond the Arab World, The Odyssey of Ajami and Muridia, from Oxford Unity Pre University Press, 2016. Uh, <clears throat> Falu uh, is a proud native of Casamance in uh, Senegal. Uh, he got his uh, first degree in English at uh, Université Gaston Berger in Saint Louis. Uh, he then came to the United States and uh, got a master's or two masters at uh, Montana, uh, where I believe he met his wife, which is a, an important accomplishment there. Um, so he still goes back to Montana uh, every year and stays in a yurt for a week um, to go camping. Um, <clears throat> he uh, then uh, went on to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign to get his uh, PhD in Frank French linguistics. Uh, he came to uh, Boston University 12 years ago um, to be the director of the African language program. Uh, and I came a year after him and have relied on him very heavily when I was director of the African studies program. And then uh, with much cajoling, I pushed him to consider being the director after me, which he has taken on and uh, uh, done a fantastic job of uh, helping to reshape the African studies uh, program at BU and bringing lots of new inspiration. Um, I had the a great privilege of spending a month in Senegal with Falou uh, as we co-directed a Fulbright Hayes faculty program there. Uh, you can learn a lot about somebody by how they interact with their parents. Um, I got to go to uh, Falou's home uh, in Ziegenshore, uh, and I can say that based upon the respect that he shows to his mother and the other elders in his, uh, in his uh, hometown, that he is a good man, deep in his core. So it is my honor to turn the mic over to Falun Gong. Thank you very, very much for those kind words. And uh, thank you to uh, Ben and the uh, African Studies uh, Association. It gives me a distinct pleasure to uh, share with you uh, my work and uh, hopefully to motivate some of the uh, emerging new scholars in African Studies. And what I want to do, I know many of you are getting ready to have lunch. So I want to keep the discussion maybe short, huh? but uh, hopefully interesting for many of you. Uh, in general, when we talk, of, when we talk about Africa, <clears throat> especially Sub-Saharan Africa, we've emphasized oral traditions of Africa, as if Africa is the only continent uh, devoid of written traditions. And the result is that we engage sources that do not involve African voices, uh, namely sources written in Europhone languages and the Roman script. 
And I think that we're missing a lot when we ignore all the equally important sources of knowledge written in all the scripts, whether uh, Arabic derived or all the indigenous locally invented scripts. So what I want to do with you is to share with you what I know best in terms of sources of knowledge in Africa that remain really understudied, particularly Ajami sources, sources that are written with modified Arabic script based on classical Arabic script named Warsh. And it's important to make that distinction because modern standard Arabic is based on hafs. And the hafs writing system has features that are different from the Warsh writing system that is the base of most West African Ajami traditions. So the first challenge for people who speak Arabic, <coughs> modern standard Arabic, is to read, to learn the Warsh-based writing that has been enriched by the Wolof, by the Hausa, uh, by the Fulani. And I want to share with you what we were missing because in these communities, orality and written traditions are not mutually exclusive. They are complementary. These materials that Usman Khan refers to as non-Europhone materials, that is to say materials produced by scholars in non-Europhone traditions, can help us really enhance teaching and research on Africa. So what I want to do here is to really look at the sources in Ajami. And what is really Ajami is nothing more than the enrichment of the Arabic script to write any language that is not Arabic. And that include Persian, Urdu, Chinese among the Uyghurs, <laughs> Spanish in Andalus, uh, Portuguese. So it's not different from the traditions that we find among the Hausa, the wall of English, in the case of a slave called Abu Bakr al-Siddiqui in Jamaica, whose master understood that he was more literate than himself and asked him to keep records of the plantation. And he did so in English Ajami, writing English with the Arabic script. How does Ajami really work? <clears throat> this is an example of the wall of enrichment of the Arabic script. Arabic does not have p, or g, or ny, or ng, or ch, or mp. All these prenasals do not exist in Arabic, which are key features you can find in last names of Senegambians, ngom, ndur, mbai. They have to be written. So what the local scholars did was to use existing Arabic letters. Can I point? Is there a way to point to uh, the red? Nope, it's not doing it. OK. How do I go back here, you see? Uh, forward. OK. I can't, I can't point. OK, so Arabic has ba which is uh, the first letter that you see over there without the dots. Okay. Arabic has k, but not g. What the Wolof did was to take the Arabic bar and to add three dots on top. For the car, they added three dots on top. And because it's not standardized, sometime in a text, you may find one or the other. This lack of standardization has been used to highlight a limitation of Ajumi, mostly by outsiders. <laughs> but these are not limitations for insiders. In fact, just as anyone who has a knowledge of Arabic, 
They can predict what vowel comes, right? They don't need vocalization. In the same way, Ajami users are familiar with these variations in the writings of their own scholars in their communities. Okay. So when we look at them from an outside perspective, these may appear to be disorganized, but in reality, it's really a problem for outsiders, not for insiders. Okay. And I think that's an important point to make. But it's the same system, in the same way the Latin script spread through Christianity, so too the Arabic script spread through Islam and was enriched to write numerous languages around the world. Most of these traditions initially began as part of pedagogies to disseminate Islam to illiterate masses, but they expanded, the functions expanded in the same way Latin expanded from the church to cover other areas of human knowledge. But what, what's very interesting is that, in fact, there is recent evidence that the orthography of Arabic itself developed following the same long durée principles of Ajami. That is to say, derived from Aramaic writing system. According to Daniel, the corpus of pre-Islamic Arabic language inscriptions dated from 328 and 568 CE were written in Nabataean, early Arabic script. According to him, the Arabic orthography developed following the Nabataean Arab who modified Aramaic script with diacritics, what I call the powerful dots. It appears that the numbers of the Arabic letters remain the same around the world. The difference is always about a dot. <laughs> How many dots? One dot, two dots. And where are you going to place them? Are they going to be on top? Or are they going to be below? Uh, in reality, these dots allow scholars to multiply the phonology, the orthographic system to represent world phonologies, vowels and systems. So it's not different from what actually gave birth to the Arabic script itself. And this is a very important uh, work, and I think this reference is actually very useful for those interested in the history of scripts. It also raises an important question. Who owns the script? Uh, it's a very difficult question. You know. uh, is the Arabic script Aramaic uh, belongs to Aramaic or uh, Ajami uses? Who owns the script is a very difficult question to answer right? when you look at it from a long durée perspective. This is just a map to give you an idea of the scope of Islam and the Arabic script from Africa to other parts of the world. In Africa, there are about 80 languages with records, of course, different degrees, but with records of Ajami writing. And they all constitute important sources of African knowledge. The problem is Ajami is excluded in official literacy statistics because of the colonial definition of literacy that is espoused by African governments, but also by international organizations for example, in 2005, the United Nations adult literacy rate for Niger was estimated to be at 29%, for Senegal, 42% in 2006, for Guinea, 38% in 2008. Yet, according to a small census, in, in the Labe areas in Guinea, there are over 70% Ajami literates, among which 25, 20 to 25 women. Okay. In Jurbel, Podor, and Matam, over 70% Ajami literacy. In Hausa area, especially in Niger and uh, Nigeria, over 80% of Ajami literacy. So we're really missing millions of people who have been producing knowledge before the colonial encounter but whose knowledge is excluded 
in the production of knowledge about themselves. I think it's time to go beyond that. So African Ajami literates are generally misrepresented because of the definition of literacy that is used in sub-Saharan Africa as the ability to read and write in European languages or the ability to use the Roman script, which has been espoused by governments, as I said, and international organizations, and excludes millions of Ajami literates in Africa. How does one acquire Ajami literacy? Ajami literacy is generally derived from Quranic schools. This, uh, this example, this image that you see is a typical example of a Quranic school in Casamance. The two, uh, the, the children, boys and girls, are exposed to the Arabic script through the wooden tablets they hold on their hands, on which verses of the Quran are written, and they read them and memorize them. As a result, they're exposed to the Arabic script, particularly the Warsh-based, and it's important to emphasize that, the Warsh-based Arabic script. There are seven Qira'at, reciters of the Quran. One of them is Imam Warsh, whose dialectal features has impacted the writing system of Arabic. It is that variety that has been modified. Okay? And so here, children are exposed to at the lower levels. As they move in higher levels, as the second uh, young lady here, they move to the paper-based acquisition of knowledge. In this case, it's uh, uh, in Tuba, and part of the curriculum is to study and copy the work of Shah Ahmed Bamba. And you can see the second one is still a young lady working on uh, copying uh, verses of the Quran on the uh, wooden tablet. Okay. So this is, it is through these exposures to the Arabic script that they first encounter literacy. In many cases, many of them may drop out, like myself, and uh, they become shopkeepers and tailors and farmers. The only writing skills they have is the writing skills they have acquired in this system. And what's fascinating about their writing system, you know, their materials, they reflect their own preoccupations. Debt, somebody's goat is lost. <laughs> Things of real life experience. As those who continue become elite, and they have to write a copy of their own Quran, first without vocalizations, and then with vocalizations and calligraphy, with dots and shudder and punctuation. And these are evaluated by experts. When they graduate, they become what we call hafiz. They have mastered the Quran, they have it in their head and in their heart. And to use my good friend Bushway's words, they have become walking Qurans, those who embody the ethical and spiritual dimensions of Islam. Right? And key features of these documents, you see there's no page number, but the last word that you see there is the first word of the next page. <laughs> so the system works this way. The most highly educated one produced documents that I regard as sometimes the equivalent, not really the equivalent, but comparable to a thesis with comments from professors. <laughs> These documents that remain to be studied, we have collected a lot of them, and they vary between 100 to 1,000 uh, pages sometimes, sometimes commentaries of the Quran, Sometimes commentaries on other liturgical texts, such as fiqh, jurisprudence, sometimes grammar, uh, sometimes poetry, mad. And what happened is that the teacher may require that the student copies one document first and then meets the teacher to discuss the document. And through that interactions, 
Comments are made on the margins and inside the text, and these comments could be multilingual. If the concept was explained in Soninke, which is the language of education, of Islamic education in Senegambia, for the Mandinka people, the word may be explained in Soninke. If the word was, if another concept was explained in Mandinka, <laughs> the gloss may be in Mandinka. So you have three languages interacting here, Arabic, Soninke, and Mandinka. And other generation may even add their own comments that you can even trace based on the type of ink that is used. So if we treat these people as illiterate, when actually they are multiliterate. <laughs> They're multilingual, they speak many languages, but they're also multiliterate. <laughs> I think it's important to engage them at Boston University. We've digitized, and I have to thank my colleagues here and uh, the support of Boston University and our team. Uh, now we have over 30,000 pages of Ajami materials in Hausa, Wolof, Fulfulde, Kanuri, Nupe, Malagasy, Ajami, and I, we hope that students will uh, begin to study them. Another <clears throat> channel through which literacy is, uh, is acquired, <clears throat> we have assumed that literacy is often is, uh, uh, acquired through Quranic schools, as I have already discussed. But there is another channel through which literacy is acquired, and it's through music. What I call, for a lack of better term, music-derived literacies, which means that some of these poems may be very short, and they contain local metaphors, powerful metaphors that people can relate to in rhythmic patterns that are good to hear. And when they chant it in the rural villages, people are interested in these documents because of the beauty of the songs and the messages conveyed through those songs and they memorize them, and they later learn to read, to decipher the script. <laughs> and this is an example. Can we hear? So what's interesting is this channel of acquisition of knowledge through music is under research. And it shows that acquisition of literacy is not always driven from the eyes, visual. It might start, in this case, through music. And what has happened in the past in rural areas when people were recited these things are now being found online for the diaspora. So many people listen to these songs, and you can see the number uh, below the image, There's about over 70,000 people who have watched this clip among the murids across the world in the diaspora. Some of them illiterate, and by listening to these songs, they acquire literacy. They acquire literacy not only in Ajimi Wolof, but also in Arabic. Okay. And I think this is a very important area that is open for studies uh, this is just to give you a sense of the content of this poem and why it would uh, be attractive to people. Your schools are hospitals where all the sick people must go. You, you treat anyone who comes. You are the physician of the century. Sicknesses of the heart and of the body, you cure them all, all till people are thankful. The sick must be grateful to you for you have cured the century. You found the country impoverished and found everyone miserable. You fed us with luxurious gift, food, and nourished everyone in the century. You found some crippled and some completely depressed. Others were refused wives, 
and some were unimportant like me. You mended those who were broken, strengthened what was not straight, elevated homes that were modest till they could cope with the century. You gave the have-nots, educated the uneducated. You revealed concealed treasures. You have revived the soul of the century. So if you are a wall of speaker, beyond the content, the metaphors that are embedded in these songs, you cannot avoid being, being impressed. Okay? And I think this is very, very important, uh, a very important area to begin to see how knowledge transmission occurs in these communities, beyond our traditional understanding of acquisition of uh, learning through visual experience. So in this, this is a non-exhaustive list of the key concepts and key themes that are discussed in Ajami literatures that we have in our collection at Boston University. Talismanic protective, protective devices, texts on astrology, divination, religious and didactic materials in poetry and prose, elegies, translations of works on Islamic metaphysics, fiqh, jurisprudence, tasawwuf, Sufism, translations of the Quran from Arabic into African languages, including translation of the Bible <laughs> in African languages, secular writings such as commercial and administrative record keeping, family genealogies, records of important local events such as foundations of villages, births, deaths, and weddings, biographies, political and social satires, advertisements, road signs, public announcements, speeches, personal correspondences, traditional treatment of illnesses, medicinal plants, incantations, salalo in Mandinka. It's an interesting genre. Uh, we've collected a lot of salalos. Incidentally, some of them bear striking similarities with texts rec recovered in the Americas, produced by enslaved Africans in the Americas. Okay. And I think this is another area open for studies. History, local customs, ancestral traditions, and texts on diplomatic matters, behavioral costs, and grammar. So aren't we missing a lot when we exclude these sources in the production of knowledge about Africa? I think, I think we're missing a lot. The scholars, I have found in general three trends, major trends of scholars. The first one is a group I call social scientists because they work like social scientists. They conduct field work, they travel, they collect information, they triangulate their sources, they analyze, they give references and footnotes. And the second one is what I call the esoteric scholars. These are the ones interested in astronomy and astrology, in, in, in numerology, in healing uh, techniques, and poets and singers. Okay. You can see here, orality and written literacy are really interlaced. Written documents are always verbalized, okay, are either chanted or recited. Right. So it's very, where do you draw the line? Okay. It's better to see them as forming continua. Of course, this categorization is not really to be seen as a generalization because you might have a social scientist who is actually also interested in poetry <laughs> and they write poems. So it's just to show the major trends. This is one of them. Imam al Fuseni Manjan, we encountered in, uh, uh, in uh, Seju. His collection is one of the most interesting collections. Because he has collections that deal with the Kabul Empire, war and peace in the region, pre-Islamic local heroes, resistance to uh, the Portuguese colonization in Guinea-Bissau, key leaders who fought major battles. I mean, his collection is really, really extensive, including a map, a map of the Kabul Kansala uh, kingdom and the fortresses they organize around the royal compounds. Okay. I think he's, so you can see he's an imam, but he's also interested in history. Okay. Where do you draw the line again between secular and religious is complicated in these in this, in this sources. Okay. 
Another one that is interesting is <clears throat> this document by a wall of social scientist, Abibulai C. What is interesting in this document is the way they date their document. In this document, he's tracing the history, genealogy of the Mbake family from the 17th century to the 20th century. And he says that the grandfather was born in Aikashi and died in Shanyanja in Yurushi. These two words may be regarded as gibberish because they do not mean anything in Wolof. Well, the reality is it's a dating system. In this system, each consonant has a numerical value. The Y stands for 10. The K stands for, the K stands for 100. The SH stands for 1,000. In the Muslim calendar, that corresponds to 1,110 Anum Hijra. The Yurushi, same, the Y stands for 10, the R stands for 200, the SH stands for 1,000, and that means 1210 Anum Hijra, Muslim calendar. If you convert that to the Gregorian calendar, you will get 1698, 1795, which means that this person lived about 100 years. So this is clearly an important area with significant potential contribution to African historiography. Of course, men have been dominant in the production of knowledge, not only among these people, but around the world. But we do find important work by women, including Nana Asmau, that many of you know, in this case, this is only one uh, case of Sohna Maimuna Tumbake, who has written uh, several poems, and many of her sisters did. One particular poem caught my attention is a poem that she wrote uh, presenting her condolences to her husband and family for her own daughter they lost at a young age. It's a very, very moving poem that continues to be recited in, in Murid communities. Uh, in Senegal and the Tuba areas. Kinship and the elasticity of ethnicity. Well, we all know that ethnicity can be a source of problems in some parts of Africa. But it's also important to understand and to, as this text shows, that ethnicity can also be flexible. That in many parts of Africa, Ethnicity is actually very elastic. And this document, which traces the genealogy of the Mbake family, shows us the maternal and paternal lineages of Amadou Bamba. And the document traces the Fulani roots of his family to its full Wolofization, including the first person who became fully Wolofized and lost his Fula, his fula <laughs> and could only speak Wolof. So we would say uh, in, in, in the Fagalli, in Wolof, we would say the Fagalli. Is that not correct? Fagalli, yeah. Ajami is also found in medicine, local medicinal practices. In this case, this is an excerpt from a table of content, Louis Fatsachent, healing varicella, healing any type of eye pains, healing rheumatism, healing stomachache, healing headache, healing sore throat, healing toothache, healing someone who cannot urinate, benefits of the parrot's tongue for healing children with speech disorder. I haven't tried any of these yet, but... Uh... <laughs> A new genre of text that I call bureaucratic, all of Ajemi genre. This is an interesting genre that allows to see local institutions, how the bureaucracy operates. The first one on the right is written by the office, comes from the office of the female leader of the Baifal family, Sohna Umimbake, uh, Sohna Umifal, Sohna Umifal. And the document is asking, requesting help from the Murids to help her build 
a, a, a house in a land that was granted to her. And these documents, that document, all of these documents are usually, again, copied and distributed. And that's how I got them. But they're also read in public and in local radio stations. Again, the complementarity between oral and written, again, is very clear here. The second one is interesting. The second one is an acknowledgement of a financial contribution to one infrastructure they were building in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Tuba area. So most of the transactions that occur in the Murid tradition generate in the leadership bureaucratic paperwork of these sorts. Okay. So I think these are important sources of knowledge that could help understand how local uh, institutions function. Ajami in pre-colonial diplomacy. It's interesting that in the initial contact between Europeans and Africans, Literacy in Ajami was recognized, and Ajami was even recognized as a diplomatic means of communication. What's interesting in this text is that, as you can see, the first sentence is Bismillahi Rahmani Ar Rahim, which is in good Arabic. The rest is in Wolof. But when Muslims write, whether they write about their horse they lost, or, or, or they're asking to, uh, to be helped to build, to build one space, uh, one home somewhere, they might begin with Bismillah rahman rahim okay. And this has misled many scholars to assume that the rest is gibberish or unreadable Arabic, as some call it, or the larable and decipherable, undecipherable Arabic. In this case, this document was produced when the French King Louis XVIII was interested in having a trading post in the Gambia, along the Gambia River, and encountered King Bar, and King Bar asked him to lay down his proposition. And of course, the French king dictated his proposition to his scribe, who wrote it down, and that's the text on the left side. And King Bar also responded to that proposition, asked his scribe to write down his response. That's the text that you have on the right side. Because the power balance was equal, they both regarded as diplomatic languages. As soon as colonization took over, now the descendants of the King Bar are all treated as illiterate. So literacy is ultimately a power issue. This is uh, my uncle, my late uncle, who uh, passed away. And we were building a house in uh, 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 Kursose. And I'm sure my wife uh, is here, knows how much money we have put there. <laughs> but hope we will finish it uh, very soon, OK? So you can see he was documenting, he was documenting the transactions uh, in uh, Ajumi, including expenses, cement, and everything. Ajumi, an advertisement. In this case, this person is not very popular. And he's saying, uh, Serene Damlo is a healer and a fortune teller. Anything you want is available at his location. Your problem will be solved, God willing. Serene Lo is very knowledgeable. He is not well known, but he is doing well. The distance to his place is 500 meters, OK? While the Senegalese government continued to ignore these people, the French cell phone company understands that there is money to be made here. They have begun to sell some of their products using Ajumi, water to call, messas, message, internet, uh, internet, etc. For those who always think that Ajumi is always about Religious matters, I have this counter example for them. <laughs> Urinating prohibited at this place. Clearly, the writer understood to write in Ajumi might be more effective in communicating. This document is interesting 
and it's collected by my colleague Lamin Jallo here. It's a polar Ajumi that describes four major dialects of the Fula language in Africa. You can see the document again begins with a doxology in Arabic, but the rest is a poem in Pular that shows how the different varieties of Pular. This is a survival French. The first column is Farancais. So the person has picked up survival French phrases and noticed that there were people who were interested in survival French and is teaching French through Pular Ajami. This is an interesting one, a critic of the transatlantic slavery. In this poem, the, the, poet is, the, the poet argues that the fate of the people who were involved in slavery, they did not have a good ending. And a good ending, a beautiful ending, is a very important thing, mujigurafet, in the Senegambian worldview, because of their sins of involvement in slavery. Let's just go through the poems very quickly. This world has misled many people. Where are those who were kings and their servants? Where are those who used to ride their horses to catch, snatch, sell, and herd slaves? Where are they? Who knows where those who used to wake up looking for slaves to sell, ravage villages, and make people cry and run away are? Who knows where those who used to beat royal drums to assemble all people and who could belittle and disparage poor people are? See the fate of the aristocrats who used to be surrounded by crowd, carrying firearms they led in wars. Where are they? What about those who used to wander and rage war and tyrannize and share people like animals and their opportunistic servants? Where are they? What about those who would kill people and order killings while they sat above and watched with their wide eyes, open arrogantly? Where are they? What about those who used to kill each other and summon crowds who came and assembled tightly in one place to listen to their orders? Where are they? What about those who, used, who, who would be, betray each other, draw weapons against each other, and argue and get drunk? Clearly, he's talking about my ancestors, my Chedo ancestors. <laughs> who knows where they are? Ignoring God's injunction is unprofitable. For if you do it, you will not have a beautiful ending. No one knows where those who used to do unrighteous acts are. Those who were kings and their servants alike have all disappeared inside the earth. Those who were arrogant and those who were humble alike, where are they? Repent and be grateful to God and strive to obtain his endorsement. And do not ever be among those who no one knows where they are. Okay? And finally, I have, this is, I'm sure many of you have already listened, seen this one. Uh, World War, a Mandinka poem that's trying to destroy Adolf Hitler. <laughs> because in this community, the war had impact, World War II had impact on this community. And in this community, they believe in what they call Dankaro, the binary potency of words. Elders who have purified their hearts, their words are imbued with power to elevate you, to make you successful, but also the reverse, to destroy you. And in this case, he wanted to make sure that the person who was bringing so much harm to the young people who were being drafted is destroyed. And this is what the poem says. They call it Ikile. And again, the first sentence is in good Arabic. The rest is in Mandinka. Ikile, the German, has brought evil to the world. <clears throat> May God take away all his evil. If he is assisted by powerful demons, may those demons be destroyed. If he is helped by his political skills, may those skills be lost for good. May God bring evil on him so that he may fear himself and his deeds. May God throw thunder on him to destroy his skull and flesh. May he be betrayed by his own doctor. May he make, it, may, may he make him drink poison until he's unconscious. May the great angels destroy his planes and make them catch fire in the air and fall. 
It's becoming localized now. <laughs> no young man is here now. You cause our people and our guests to run away. The first to run away were Arfan Jamme, Kamara, Maroon, and many others. As for Damfa, he's worried for his wife is pregnant and his children can't work Ikilea, okay? As for Kan Jamme, he wept so hard until I felt sad for him. Evil is not good, Ikilea. Ikilea, may God destroy you inside your protected building. Ikilea, may you have the sickness of swelling belly and swelling genital. It's interesting, it gives us through this document we have a sense of public health concerns <laughs> around that period. May you feel the agony and cry and die. Amen, amen. May God fulfill our prayers. May the human race be saved from Ikilea's evil. So you see, his concern actually transcends his community. And then he concludes again in good Arabic, in the name of the prophet Sheikh Saribu, whose curse is most feared. Okay. And finally, I, I need a few minutes to wrap up this. Yeah? So what I just talked about is about Arabic-derived sources in Ajami. Okay? But we should understand that there are also equally important sources of knowledge that are written in indigenous scripts that we need to engage. And one of the most fascinating ones that I have found is the Edo chromatographic writing system, where colors and shapes are used to convey meaning. Uh, nothing significant has been done in this system. I am more interested in the material culture that sustains the production of colors in this system. Okay. But there are clearly other writing systems, Bagam, Bamungis, uh, Nko, Tifinak, Vai, and others. And all of these should be included in the narratives about Africa. In conclusion, in order to do justice to the millions of non-Europhone Africans whose records and voices have been excluded in the narratives about their societies, I invite the African Studies community to do the following. To go beyond the holistic treatment of Sub-Saharan Africa as a land of orality par excellence by recognizing that African sources of knowledge are varied and encompass both written and oral sources that need to be cross-pollinated. The African library, so to speak, should be construed as including oral sources, written sources in indigenous scripts, written sources in Arabic and Ajami, and written sources in European languages and the Roman script, and also embodied sources of knowledge. Okay. We also need to overcome, and I think this is an important point, the old linguistic paradox in academia by investing in learning African languages and scripts. In the same way, we invest in learning European languages or Chinese when studying European and Chinese societies. Finally, we need to bridge the gap between Europhone and non-Europhone scholars of Africa through translation. And one of the good efforts that I have found is the, book, the work of my good friend, uh, Professor uh, Girma Negash, translations uh, of the conscript, which is an important contribution. And I think we need to have similar work translation from Ajimi and all these translation into major European languages so we can bridge this gap. Okay. The bulk of the materials produced in this in, by non-Europhone scholars and lay people in Africa are not studied. And so we, in our NEH project, were planning to translate, transcribe and translate materials on astronomy, medicine, healing, history, poetry, governance and politics into French and English. And I want to thank some of my colleagues who are here, uh, Davy, Lamin Jallo, and others, and David Glovsky, uh, who are contributing to this project. When such non-Europhone sources are translated and studied, they will enhance African studies in the 21st century in significant ways. Besides revealing multiple local agencies, these non-Europhone archives enable us to hear Enduring voices of learned and average Africans that have been silenced in academic discourses for centuries. Thank you very much for your attention. Falu, that was really quite something. I think uh, we're all really 
taken aback by the, the promise and the power of uh, your research and those of your research colleagues. Um, I'd like to uh, present you with a, a plaque. That's pretty nice. So please join me again in thanking Professor Ngong. As I mentioned at the beginning of today's talk, uh, this is a lecture that becomes a published essay. Uh, last year's distinguished essay is already in print, and uh, Falouz will be uh, uh, making its way to us, and it will be uh, peer-reviewed and um, make its way into publication in time uh, before next year's annual meeting. Uh, I want to alert you to uh, the annual program uh, which describes this particular lecture series and, and, and let you know that we have a public and open invitation for nominations for next year's Distinguished Lecture. So please feel free to either contact me or the managing editor, Catherine Saluka, uh, with your suggestions for nominations to give the lecture in DC, in Washington DC next year. I also want to draw your attention to another innovation this year that the journal has added, which is the ASA author ribbon. I know some of you are disappointed because a number of the ribbons went missing, but ours didn't. And so you will see some of our more uh, recent ASA authors uh, wearing these orange ribbons. And um, take the opportunity to talk to those people if you're interested in publishing in our journal. We uh, want our journal to be the journal of the ASA, the journal of the association. We want to encourage and include as many Africa-based scholars as possible, as many emerging scholars as possible. So if you have something that you'd like to share with us, something that you presented at this conference, I invite you to consider submitting to our journal. And uh, I invite you to uh, walk up to one of um, people wearing these orange ribbons and ask them about their experience publishing with our journal. Uh, so without further ado, I bring this meeting to a close and let's thank Falu Ngom once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh really?